Good morning, Grace Church. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. Woo. Give the Holy Spirit a hand, right? He brought us all here. That's amazing. Okay, so I heard a story uh, once about a young uh, piano prodigy um, who gave his first professional uh, concert. And people have heard of, had heard of his ability, uh, and the concert was sold out. 2,000 tickets um, purchased in one day, and his performance was mesmerizing. It was amazing, uh, stellar, uh, crazy good. And at the end, the crowd went wild. They all jumped up to their feet, cheering and applauding. And the young man stood up, he nodded, and he shuffled off the stage. Well, the audience were cheering even louder, chanting for him, come back out, come back out, take another bow. And the young man peeped through a crack in the curtain and didn't move. And the stage manager rushed up to him and said, young man, go out quickly. They're calling for you. They're calling for you. But the boy stayed put. He just continued to scan the crowd through the curtain. And the stage manager said, go. They're all standing for you. And the young man finally replied, no, I can't go out yet. You see that older man way in the back row? He's not standing. He's my mentor and my teacher. When he stands, I'll go and take a bow. The young man had not been playing for the crowds of thousands. He had played for an audience of one. You know, I saw the same basic thing when I went to my grandson Lorenzo's VPK graduation um, service a few weeks back. All the five-year-olds came out in caps and gowns. It was so cute. And they stood on the stage and in front of the sea of friends and relatives uh, in the audience. They prepared to sing and recite their ABCs and their numbers. And there were so many people watching. But watch and see what Lorenzo does. Watch this. See, there were dozens and dozens of people at that VPK graduation, but Lorenzo only cared about his mom watching him. Lorenzo was living for an audience of one. So here's a good question. On the stage of your life, who are you looking to in the audience for applause? Whose approval matters most to you? Who are you waiting to stand up and applaud you before you take your final bow? Now, here's something I know because I'm a mom, and you may know it too. There's a phase in a kid's life where parents or grandparents' um, approval means the most, right? Uh, by the time they're in middle school, not so much. It's not parents. It's friends, right, whose approval means the most. In this phase, if you ask them the question, if all your friends jumped off a bridge, would you jump off too? The answer probably is yes. Yes, I would. I would jump off the bridge also. You know, because needing approval of a parent or friends are two phases that we all go through as kids. They're natural. But as adults, we ought to grow out of that. The problem comes if we don't grow past these phases. Here's what I mean. Have you ever caught yourself, as an adult, trying to live for the approval of other people? I tell you all the time that I'm in 12-step recovery from drugs and alcohol from, for a lot of years now, and when I was a kid, I always tried to be the best kid. I wanted the best grades, and I got them. And I wanted the best talents, and I had them. And I wanted the best awards, and I got those too. All to please my mother, who can never be pleased due to her own mental illness. And around the age of 13, I saw I was never going to get her approval. So instead of being the good kid, I became the bad kid. But guess what? By being the bad kid, I was still craving my mother's attention. I wanted her to notice me. And I lived a lot of years of addiction, never growing out of that phase. So many people I know have lived their whole lives trying to get approval of parents, trying to please parents who aren't even alive anymore to see them. I've prayed with people who are exhausted by the frustrating goal of trying to make other people happy. 
Some people are living for the approval of their friends, their family, their neighbors, their co-workers, their children, their mentors, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Here's the deal, though. Trying to live for other people, whether for their attention or their applause, whether it's by trying to be the best or being the worst, is like playing a game of whack-a-mole. It's like whack-a-mole. You know, you do one thing, and you hit it, and another thing pops up. You do that thing, and there's another thing over there. Uh, you just never win, and this kind of life is going to exhaust you, right, and leave you un satisfied, unfulfilled, and inadequate. So for me, I just went off and I just began to live for my own esteem, for my own self, right? If I can't please everyone, then I'm going to please myself. I think there was an old song about that. I live for the approval of me, me, and me, and me, and I'll show you. I'll find ways to make myself happy. You see what I did there? I'll show you. I'll show you. Still showing someone else, right? I decided I'd have self-reliance, self-affirmation, and anything revolving around myself. But that didn't work. You know why that didn't? That, you know why that didn't work to fill me? Because I knew myself way too well to approve of myself. <laughs> no matter how much stuff or money uh, or men or prestige I tried to scrape up as I was actively ruining my life with the stuff that I thought was making me feel better about myself, I couldn't seem to satisfy my own craving for. Approval. It's no wonder that the band The Rolling Stones recorded a song that could be the anthem of our souls. In fact, Mick, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards captured our struggle when they wrote it. And I thought maybe we could just, like, let our band do it. Maybe they can just... Maybe they can just... Maybe they can just help us out with it. Right? Count it off, Chris. Come on, count it off. You know it. I know you know it. I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction. Cause I try. aren't they? <laughs> Do you know this song, Satisfaction? It still holds the record of being number 31 on the all-time forever music charts. It has won Grammys. It was inducted into the Hall of Fame. It was added to the Library of Congress in 2006. And why? Because can't we all relate? We try, and we try, and we try, and we try, and we just can't seem to fill that craving in our souls. We crave satisfaction, and we just can't get it. We just can't get no satisfaction. Seeking the applause of others, and even ourselves, we're never satisfied. You know, another word for satisfied might be happy. We can't find lasting happiness. Not with money or sex or influence or alcohol or drugs or busyness or success or any other thing our world has to offer. No matter how much we crave it, we can't seem to find it. So where then do we turn? What will satisfy that inner craving that seems like nothing can satisfy well? This morning, we continue with part four of our Sunday series that we're calling Beyond Happy. We've been walking through the beginning of Jesus' most famous sermon he ever preached that we call the Sermon on the Mount. 
where Jesus talks about the eight qualities of people who are blessed. We call these the Beatitudes. We call them be attitudes. In other words, the attitudes we can be that help us to live our lives blessed by God. And we've been really considering how being blessed is what we're looking for when we're saying we're looking for happiness and satisfaction. These beatitudes that Jesus talked about are actually the secrets to lasting satisfaction and contentment because the definition of blessed is this. Say it with me. It's on the screen. We've been saying it for a few weeks ago. Blessed, made happy by God through total dependence on God. So today we get to find the one whose approval and applause we've been looking for and longing for and craving all along. Because here's the good news for all of us who have tried and have tried and have tried and have tried to get some satisfaction. Only God can satisfy my craving. Say it with me. Only God can satisfy my craving. Only God. And here's why. Here's why. Because whether you know it or not, you are God-dreamed, God-designed, and God-desired. God wants a relationship with you so much that he built a desire for a relationship with him into the very fabric of your being. In other words, that hole in your soul, that craving that you feel for satisfaction, it's something that only God can fill. This is how you and I were made. Here's how author C.S. Lewis put it in his really awesome book called Mere Christianity. You should find it sometime and read it. It's really good. He said, Creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. A baby feels hunger, well, there's such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swing, swim, well, there's such a thing as water. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that doesn't prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably, earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. See, this makes sense to me. The reason we have a craving in our soul is to connect with the one who created us. That's what that craving for satisfaction we can't seem to get in any other way is for. We might try, we might try, we might try, we might try to get it through other ways, but the only way I can be satisfied is when I fill myself with God. And that's why St. Augustine said this. He said, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. That's how we're made. You and I were made to be filled by God. And when we are, we are beyond happy. We're blessed. So in the past three Sundays, we've been walking through the first three Beatitudes that Jesus promised were the attitudes of people who were blessed. And today, we're going to continue on with Beatitude number four. Jesus explains what can happen to us when we see God as the only way to true satisfaction and when we start craving God instead of the things that never work. So read this fourth one with me. These are the words of Jesus again. Matthew 5, uh, verse 6. It's on the screen. Go. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. All right. So I want to talk about righteousness for a little bit. What is Jesus talking about here? Well, it turns out that righteousness is kind of a little bit of a complex thing. It really is. There, there was a time, there was a time that I would have said righteousness was reserved for hypocritical religious folks who say one thing and do another thing, who know all the right words and then turn around and stab you in the back. That's what I would have thought. Unfortunately, lots of people feel like that about Christians. So righteousness has gotten a bad rap because of that. And equally, unfortunately, it's us Christians that have been the worst offenders of making that thing happen in other people, okay? Even back in the day, uh, even back in the day, in, in Jesus' day, the religious uh, people called Pharisees um, who were around Jesus spent more time trying to trap Jesus into saying something that went against the religious rules they had, then they spent listening to Jesus' wisdom, which they probably should have been doing instead, considering Jesus was from God who made all their rules to begin with, right? Imagine trying to trap God with God's own teachings. Kind of crazy, right? 
Here's what Jesus said about them to his followers. He said, for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. That was Matthew 5.20. That's why nowadays when we use the word Pharisee for someone, like, boy, that person's a Pharisee, it usually means hypocrite. And it unfortunately somehow gets mixed up with a bad version of righteousness. But another aspect of righteousness that gets a little closer to the mark has to do with living right. Has to do with living right. We think of living right, when we think of living right, we, th we think about doing our very best to do the right thing when it comes to the actions we take and the motivations we have. We're going to do our very best to have the right motives and do, and, and, and do, the, and do the right behaviors. So perhaps we might think that um, maybe all we have to do is to do our very best um, to think right and do right, and then we'll be blessed, right? Well, yes, but it's a little deeper than that. Here's what I mean. What exactly are the right things? Right? What exactly are the right things? Ask 10 different people who are following Jesus their best interpretation of what the right thing to do is in any situation, and you will get 10 different answers. I know as someone in recovery, I've had a terrible struggle with doing my best to take right actions and having right motives. And that's even after giving my life to Jesus, right? What seems right to me can sometimes not be actually the right thing to do at all. I don't know if you can relate to that at all. You know, Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Well, have you ever hunger and thirsted for a right path to take in your life and you found out after you took it it was completely wrong, right? Have you ever hungered and thirsted for, for a right relationship that ends up to be so wrong in hindsight? I, I mean, have you ever hungered and thirsted to spend your time and energy and money on the right sorts of pursuits uh, that ended up leading nowhere after a while? J just doing our best to live right isn't the complete righteousness that Jesus is talking about when he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because interpreting what right living is often still puts me right in the middle of figuring out what to do as if I know. Even the Pharisees were doing their best to do the right thing, right? The problem was that they weren't seeking living for an audience of one. Say it with me again. It's on the screen. Only God can satisfy my craving. So Jesus says, what if we had hunger and thirst to live for the applause of an audience of one? What if that is what we craved above all else? See, here's what I think that Jesus is getting at when he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I think Jesus is saying that we're blessed when everything we do, we offer it up for the applause of an audience of one. See, that's where our satisfaction comes from. We're satisfied when we hunger and thirst to please the heart of our Heavenly Father above everyone and above everything else, seeking his will and following it only. We're called to be like my grandson Lorenzo, looking for his mom's face in the crowd all the time. We're to be looking out for the one whose love and approval and applause matters most, God's. Instead of living to please our family or our friends or even ourselves, instead of doing our best to do what we think is the right thing to do, instead to crave living always to please the heart of God. You know, Jesus says those who have that craving for pleasing the heart of God will be filled. When we crave pleasing God always, we'll be satisfied. Like we are after a great meal, right? It's like, oh, I'm satisfied. <laughs> when we crave the applause of the one who loved us first and loves us best, we'll be stuffed with God's love. Our emptiness will be overflowing with the satisfaction that we crave. So that's well and good. But for the remainder of the time that we have together this morning, let's get a little more practical. If my hunger and thirst for righteousness, if living for the applause of an audience of one 
is the deal. If that's how I get filled in this life, then, then how do I actually do that? How can I actually begin to do that today, this week, right now? I think we can easily begin with two things. This can help us start. And here's the first thing. First, I can stop looking for artificial fillers to satisfy my craving. I can stop looking for artificial fillers to satisfy my craving. Let me be honest here, okay? I'm going to just be honest. I think sour gummy worms are a health food because it says it's gluten-free on the package, okay? I can fool myself pretty easily that candy is going to satisfy my craving for sweets. Actually, that's not true. The truth is that all eating candy does is increase my craving for sweets. It's a scientific fact that candy, sugar, is addictive. It's bad for your health. When I'm eating a bag of sour gummy worms, I am not doing it to please an audience of one. I'm doing it to satisfy a craving in me that will never work. You know, back in the day, I looked towards drugs and alcohol to satisfy that craving that wouldn't go away no matter what. And it never worked. I only tried and I tried and I tried and I tried more and more and more and more and it never worked. God gives us a spiritual appetite that no worldly junk food and artificial fillers will satisfy. Now, you might get a rush for a minute. You might get a rush for a minute. But then sure enough, Back comes that gnawing hunger and thirst for more and more and more. And you know how much of a worldly thing is enough, don't you? You know how much a, of a worldly thing is enough, don't you? Just a little more. Just a little more. Just a little more followers on social media and, I'll, and I'll, my, my, my loneliness will be satisfied. Just a little more better place to live and, and then my, my emptiness will be satisfied. Just a little more better transportation uh, and my self-esteem will be satisfied. Just a little more money, a little more clothes, a little more phones, more, more, more works. It works just until you see the next thing and the craving comes back again. Big time. More. You know, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote most of our New Testament Bible. And he was uh, first a respected Pharisee. He checked all those boxes, religious boxes, back in the day. But he found that the only thing that could satisfy was Jesus. While he was in prison for preaching Jesus, Paul wrote this. Just, just imagine, okay, Paul wrote this thing we're going to say, while he was in prison of all places. Philippians 4, 12 through 13, he said, I've learned by now to be quite content whatever my circumstances. I'm just as happy with little as with much, with much as with little. I found the recipe for being happy, whether full or hungry, hands full or hands empty. Whatever I have, wherever I am, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. And that same apostle Paul also discovered that the one who made him who he is, as he put it, was the only one who could, that really mattered when it came to approval. Look at me what he says in 1 Corinthians 4, 3. He says, it matters very little to me what you think of me, even less where I rank in popular opinion. I don't even rank myself. Comparisons in these matters are pointless. See, Paul found the freedom from craving. He stopped looking outside and inside for approval and began to look up for it. To hunger and thirst for righteousness means to stop looking to artificial fillers to satisfy my craving. It won't work. So that's what we can need to stop doing. Stop that. Now, here's what we can do instead, though. Here's what we can start doing. Say it with me. It's on the screen. Go. I can ask God to satisfy my craving. If you want your hunger and thirst at last to be satisfied because you've tried and you've tried and you've tried and you've tried and you can't get no, 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 and you can't get no satisfaction, then look up and seek only Jesus. No matter what else you do, seek Jesus first and foremost and always. See, Jesus promises that he will fulfill his own words recorded in John 8, 35. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. 
God alone through Jesus can satisfy our hungry and thirsty souls. He'll fill us if we'll look to him and make this the priority of our lives. And make no mistake, friends, make no mistake, this takes practice. This does not happen automatically. This takes practice to seek the applause of the audience of one in everything we do. We, we seek only God when we're hungry and thirsty. Everything else, we go through our life and everything else is going to look like the answer. When we're performing on this stage of life, the rest of the world that's standing up in applause is very compelling. So we need to be practical in our diligence towards looking to the audience of one, turning our attention and seeking Jesus again and again and again. When you're new to doing this, when we're new to seeking God's face in all we do, the Bible calls this craving spiritual milk. This is when we're kind of like a new Christian. We're a little kid. We're looking, and we need Jesus to applause us, applaud us, and he will. Every time we look at him, he'll be our daddy, and he'll applaud us, and he'll applaud us, and he'll applaud us. Crave spiritual milk. Look for Jesus to applaud you. But when we've been seeking God's face for a while, the Bible calls this craving solid food. This is when we practice scanning the audience who's applauding us for the one in the back to stand up and give us applause. God made us to grow up, to get better and more consistent and more automatic at seeking Jesus in our daily life. And part of this growing up is knowing we're living for the applause of heaven, just like Jesus did. In fact, Jesus said this in John 4, 34. He said, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And when we seek this food, that's when we get filled up. That's for us too. And when we are filled up, we become righteous. We become good from the upside in instead of the outside in. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. You know, author J.D. Walt puts the result that we have this way. To be righteous is to become ever increasingly like Jesus. And this is so much better than trying to do our best, to have a do our best checklist that never gets us anywhere anyway. Instead of a checklist of rules to do our best to keep, growing followers of Jesus live with one goal in mind, pleasing our heavenly Father, in everything we do. You know, I'd like our fantastic band to come back up because we're going <laughs> to, that would be you guys. But as you, as you all come, I don't know where you all are. I hope you're somewhere. But as you come back up, let me, let me end this. I want to I pull it in because this is the world I live in, okay? In 12-step recovery land, which is the land I live in, we have an ongoing step. It's called the 11th step. And it goes like this. Read it with me. It's on the screen. Go. We sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out, seeking only Jesus. Only. Now, I got to tell you, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. I'm heading in the right direction, though. When I'm on the stage of my life, doing my everyday stuff with the world all around me, lots of times I still turn my head. I turn my head away from the back of the audience. I turn my head away to look to satisfy my hunger and thirst in other people, places, and things. But here's what I know. The desire to please God pleases God. And God is looking towards me even when I'm not looking towards him. And he's looking towards you even when you're not looking towards him. And he draws me back. He draws my face back as I pray and at my weak attempts at meditation. I turn away from the I can't get no satisfaction. And then I find Jesus' face again and again, standing in the back as he rises to his feet in applause. And that's enough. And that's enough. Friends, when you seek Jesus' face in the crowd again and again, it's going to be enough for you too. God has his face lifted towards you. Jesus says you're blessed. Jesus said you're made happy by God through your dependence on God. You're blessed. 
when you hunger and when you thirst for righteousness. For when you do, Jesus says, I'm here, Jesus says, I will fill you. Let's stand for prayer. And then the altar is going to be open here for people to come and get filled with the righteousness of God as you turn your face towards God. Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Help us to see only you as we do. Help us to long for only you, God. We tend to wander a lot. We tend to believe the lies of more. We tend to think that you're not enough and we need other things. We tend to seek satisfaction and approval and things aside from you. But it's never enough. Because we know you bend to bless us, like we sang earlier. You bend to bless us with your filling if, you're hung, if we hunger and if we thirst for only you. Lord, I know in this crowd they're suffering. Lord, I know as we stand here praying that there's yearning. There's a craving. There's craving here. There's emptiness that only you can fill because you made us like that. So fill us, we pray, as we hunger and thirst for you, as the altar is open. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.